again to everyone um, on the Saturday afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this panel conversation and also just a, a broader dialogue and we welcome your engagement with the issues that are going to come up, but also just with your own personal experiences as well. Feel free to share within this. This morning we discussed safe spaces at the District 6 um, Homecoming Center and we decided that rather than a safe space, we want this platform to be a brave space so please feel free to share as you feel um, and yeah welcome um, I'd like to also welcome our facilitator and panelists the facilitator Mikalo Milan who is an artscape theater cultural ambassador um, Mikalo you can come up And Mikala will be um, chairing and facilitating this dialogue with our speakers, Natalia De Rocha, who is a performer and also the founder of Applause Arts Initiative, as well as Luyanda Nodilinga, who is the founder of Light, Light of Life, yes, Light of Life the Theatre Organization, as well as Oriel Hayes, who is a jazz songstress and musical storyteller. And together they have many years of experience within the South African art sector and performing art sector and within arts management. So I look forward to hearing their stories and their experiences and also to engage with the conversation with all of you. So welcome and thank you. All right, is this the microphone that I'm using? You see, if you're from Artscape, um, or you're influenced or touched by Artscape in any way, everything has to be dramatic. <laughs> you know? I mean, you, you can see, my CEO come in and says like, hello! <laughs> so these things happen, you know, these things happen. Um, it means now I have to stand at the podium. I might not be on TV, but I'm gonna be on one TV, which is YouTube. Um, and that would suffice. So ladies and gentlemen, once again, good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Molueni, ndia temba, ndia pila. Ikshaw nita piki aftri ta'alas, kuma sudia. All right, so the name is indeed Mikalo Lulamile Milan. Um, I'm not deliberate in saying the second name Lulamile. It's just that when you someone like me in the arts environment, um, who may not be in the arts because of a talent that he strives and builds his life on, such as these panelists here, who every day on the road perform, acting or so. Mine is a more developmental aspect. Uh, I play more the developmental role uh, because I'm a, I, I would describe myself as a development volunteer. You know, it's the best way to describe it because I work in various aspects and in various parts um, of development. Be it youth development, be it um, organizational development, be it capacity building, be it using the arts as a tool to achieving objectives that ri see us rise above the circumstance and more so over having young people do what they can do best. Now, my talent is on nonsense to proud. Um, MC and host here in some events, some events there. Spiel a big role spiel here and there, but I mean that element is very much key and important. So what's the interesting part about me describing myself, introducing myself as Mikalo Lulamile Milan? I am this young man born within a Kosa family that is mixed with a sense of colored um, family too. Oma's clearling, opa's Tosa, the makaha ko makla, the makaha mengsel, and they've done what they've done. <laughs> so yeah, I am a black man with a white surname. It only benefits me, not the next person, I can assure you. So if I'm running away from debits in the month, it always suits me so well, because when I get a call from any other consultant or, or any person who calls me, it's very easy for me to just change my tone, you know? Hey, yaga, what if I'm a boor man with a younger boy? When we make party, you know? So it's very easy in that way. So yeah, let me welcome you to this initiative by Cornerstone, a very, very, very packed venue today. So yeah, we must embrace it. And let's say David at two and three is a claw means. I'm not preaching, don't worry, not being biblical. So indeed, the theme that we are under here, ladies and gentlemen, is one that is informed by the simple context of lessons and successes within the context of managing the arts in South Africa. When I got the call from Toby and I was um, asked to come and be part of this initiative, I mean, you become hesitant a bit before you accept any invitation because you first have to ensure Verstanik, but the Anchan, do I know what they're talking about? Is the engagement one that's clear? I think it's one of those themes that highlight or that bring together everything that we know and everything that we are part of. And it's important that it's broken down in those three spheres and three levels. And as I said to the panelists, I mean, it's clear. Lessons, what are these lessons that we've learned? In South Africa, that's the democracy is still young, 25 years of age. Its successes are clear and obvious. 
it's faced with its challenges. It combats a lot of challenges and tackles them selectively. However, not wanting to be vocal or protesting, in as much as I'm not an artist who earns a living through art, it still does not, just like the clothing sector, it still disregards the arts for what the arts is and the value that the arts has for all of our artists. So, so recently we got back from France, Toulouse, and we learned that in France, 21 million euros is signed off just for arts alone and nothing else at all. So we have to be um, critical of these things and we have to engage these things. But I mean, part of a program like this, which, is, which says um, reclaim, you know, reclaiming our communities, reclaiming our society, reclaiming who we are in thought and in thinking, but more so over it's about reclaiming the key positions, reclaiming the key ideologies of those who played a pivotal role in a South Africa that has learned a lot of lessons within its lifetime, growing from apartheid years and having the arts as of at the forefront of many of the challenges that it found itself at that time. But then we also go into what is the successes they have. And that's exactly what these panelists will also touch on. What are the successful stories from these lessons that we have learned? And what's important is it boils down to one fact. Before freedom, there was arts. Arts could have been done anywhere, at any time, at any place. Where do we find ourselves now? We find our arts managed in various ways. How is this arts managed? You cannot just come and play your guitar here and bask anytime in C point. Don't bask here. Do you have a basking permit here? You don't bask here. No longer is there the freedom of really just coming down and just playing a song or melody or two. I can't just stand and talk much on a corner as I would like to. Because in this in the simple terms, it's clear that society is now changed into a different environment. So how is this arts managed? And I think they will look at it from their own perspectives and their own, dis under own understanding of this context. And I think for Cornerstone, what's important is that we engage this theme, we speak about this theme, so as to ensure that we broaden the minds of those outside, that we ensure that we tell the young person who sits at home and says, I want to become a singer, but I don't think I can make it, tell them there are challenges here. There are lessons we've learned. There are success stories to be told. They can be part of that. And this arts can be managed in such a way that they can grow beyond their circumstance and beyond who they are. So ladies and gentlemen, that's what it is today. And that is the program that I'll be facilitating um, in today's program. Work overtime. I'm just warming up. I've got a huge event later on, so I'm just <laughs> warming up for that. So ladies and gentlemen, you've got all your panelists here. Um, indeed, a diverse group of panelists. Let me just put that to you in a nutshell. Very diverse. I said this um, I said this to Janine in the week, and I said, Janine, don't stress. Don't worry. You're losing some panelists. Let me help you out. I'll get you some few names. And I mean, these are names that were very key to me, not because of the fact that I know them or that I've worked with them, but because there is really a story to be told in line with this theme today. Lessons and successes in the context of managing arts in South Africa. Here you have a veteran one who's been all over, who's known by all. She knows, she knows people who we look up to, she has tea with them, or she's talking, you know, she's with them all, she knows the big names. You then have a young man like Luyanda. I know he looks like that managing guy who manages the boxes in America, what's his name? King or whatever yeah. his hair just has to go gray, that's all that has to happen. So I mean, you have Luyanda here, a young man, a young man indeed, and I'm not going to make this racial, but I mean a young black man, in a panel with women also, and it's great to see that women are empowered, two women against one man. Don't count me in. And then obviously you have an artist in the form of Oriel Hayes. Um, and I think, indeed, ladies and gentlemen, you must agree with me that this panel is indeed one that is balanced, and it speaks from different backgrounds. Not only different backgrounds, but it's diverse, not because of the color that we see. Don't worry, Talucha, you're at a breaking point. Don't worry. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not to say it's diverse in that nature because of that. It's diverse because wha of what they do. It's diverse because of what I do. Who would have thought that someone would want to call himself someone in the arts? And I've always contended this thing. You must be an artist. Luanda would always say, you're not an artist, you. You're nothing, you. This thing of emceeing and being dramatic and making jokes and talking to people and playing role play for two minutes, that's not art. <laughs> not art, nothing. She said, what is art? And I think, Cornerstone, this is the kind of discussions we must have for the future. What is the arts? Is the arts really about Luanda just being an uh, uh, artist on the stage at Artscape or Baxter? And is the arts... Is the arts not me being able to have an artistic ability to keep you glued to me as I talk, you know? <laughs> so those kind of discussions really have to come up. And I've always been the one of all who's always, um, um, you know, I've always advocated for this point. I may not be, I may have made a choice to not be part of the arts by being on stage. However, I have an ability and skill that speaks to what you do, so let's use it together to ensure that in managing the arts, we are able to learn and we are able to grow in success. Sinjalo Brankai theme su al kanta, al angles. So I'm not going to waste time, I'm not going to waste time, the time is not mine, I'm not going to show off. Your very first speaker, ladies and gentlemen, lovely lady, veteran in her own right, age and her is not friends because she still looks beautiful, 
30 years of age. Look well, Marlene. She will not change anytime soon. She has the ability of changing her hairstyles in some way for you to think it's her today and it's not her, not her tomorrow. So I know her. I've had the privilege of working and with her in a great initiative such as the Alsis Rivers Got Talent. She gave me the opportunity of hosting that event, and I hosted that event for two consecutive shows in build up to its main event. And she ran the productions of that show. That's just the nature of who she is. I want to give this example so it paints a picture of what she does currently. She takes these young people, they audition, she brings them into performing on stage. Whether you win or lose, she runs consecutive programs that run constantly every weekend to develop these young people into greater, greater beings. Natalia, you don't think I remembered all of that, eh? That's why I'm an elephant in nature, gift of mine. So ladies and gentlemen, she is who she is. I drove one afternoon from Atlantis all the way to Cape Town, and there she is with the Lunga Singama on a Sunday afternoon, Heart 104.9 FM, and she's talking, and I can tell you she loves her music too. Moon River. <laughs> it's a favorite song, Moon River indeed, by Frank Sinatra. So she's that kind of low-down lady, and she's here indeed, executive director of Applause Arts Initiative. She's going to come up on stage, speak a bit about her in this dialogue, and speak to our theme. Ladies and gentlemen, please, around of applause to Ms. Natale de Rocha. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, you know, I never do these kind of things. For me to be sitting up here, I'm normally in the audience or running around backstage. You said something about the amount of money, Mikhailo, about uh, in, in France, this is the amount of money that they they have for arts and culture. I had two artists in from for Solo Africa Festival, and I had to say what amount I will pay them, otherwise they would not be allowed to come to South Africa. Whereas when we send our people outside, Sometimes they don't get paid. They come home and they do not have transit visas. I am still owed 7,000 euros since 2006 of money that was not paid, of productions that went to Spain. So I, I started with a negative. For me, it's important that we look at a cultural desk in South Africa where we as artists go and report when we leave so that they can see where we're going to work and make sure that the if anything should go wrong, that those people do not come back and take our talent out of the country. We've got a far way to go, a long way to go, but we need to look at those kind of things. So, I, I love working with talent. And even if you do not have talent, because for me the thing is what arts and culture can do to change your life. I have just worked with um, a group, group of 60 pupils, Marion High in Alsis River, Gangland Alsis River, barbed wires, and I drove in, I looked at this place and I thought, how can children study in this environment? We expect all the doctors and the lawyers and to come out of there, but they are so troubled to see that they have to work in this environment and teachers as well. There are a few teachers that are brilliant teachers I was called in by one of these teachers, and she said to me, Natalia, it's our 65th anniversary of Marion High. 65 years already in Elsie's River. Can you pull a concert together? So me, being the, you know, the bleeding heart, <laughs> I said, yes, 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 I can do anything. I went in, and I looked. I said, okay, we will do auditions for a week. Um, see what the talent is, and then in next week, for two weeks, I will be rehearsing with them. And the big night was going to be at a very famous church on Green Market Square, the Methodist Mission Church. That's now being um, housing the refugees. So on a Friday night, we performed there. 
and the Saturday night the refuse, refugees were in, in, in the church. So I went in and I looked at these children. Now, you, we deal with troubled spirits in situations like that. There's a program that's running at the school uh, called No Limits. And for all the troubled children, they get an extra class to go to No Limits so that they can work through their problems. Now, I come there and I've got no idea about your problems. We're just going to have fun. We're just going to, I'm going to teach you. So in my head, my, my favorite show and my most famous show that I, st I did, and Artscape was one of the associates, they gave me space for it, was Vavas J. And it's, it's the music of the 60s and 70s, people of color, the Richard John Smiths and the um, Steve Pittas with, you know, all those music, uh, Jonathan Butler. So I looked at it and I thought, okay, these kids, they know what they call gom. Is that gom? Gom. I, I, I can't even do the click. <laughs> so it's clunk for me, it's gom in Afrikaans. You know, yeah, yeah. So, and they have got no idea of where we come from, who we are, and, and how do we do, how do we deal with this? So I said, okay, let's do this. I will, okay, we will do this. The opening song will be Welcome to Cape Town, which is a lack of vibey song, and I choreographed it. And then we will do somewhere down the line another group song called Michael Row the Boat. It was the first time that they uh, heard this, hallelujah. So here we are, I'm teaching them these songs. And then I thought, okay, yes, a, a group can do Give a Little Love. They sang Give a Little Love. And then a group can do, oh, yes, the whole choir and everybody did Mama Tembu's Wedding. So in this way, things just sort of went. And in a way, I, I taught without really teaching. You know, for me, there was no, they were enjoying it. It was, l they loved it. They wanted just to, to perform. I get now on WhatsApp, Natalia, when are we going to perform again? Natalia, when are we doing this? So those are the things, and I feel sad that I cannot go back to that school to build on what we have, what I've just done for two weeks, for three weeks with them. Because, so I have another project that I have did with them is I went and I spoke to the grade 10s and 11s, and I asked them, pertinent questions about education. What would you like to do when you finish matric? There's doctors and lawyers and um, psychologists and midwives, but they have no idea why they chose that or why they chose their stream in grade nine. They chose this because it's so much easier but when I get to matric, I can't go and do law because I don't have the right subjects. So, so it's, it's a big, I tend to get involved with much bigger than just arts and culture. And, and for me, it's, it's hard, but it's also using your network. I know I'm pointing every time to you, Marlene. Marlene, and Artscape, that's my network when it comes to performance space. I have people that own uh, buildings and if they can give me uh, accommodation for the people that's coming in, that's it, that's sponsorship. So I use my, my network. Uh, clothing, I had uh, Carducci C Squared, Monatic, sponsored me for 10 years. All the kids got dressed by Monatic. So these are the kind of things for me are very, very, it's sort of the broad strokes. I have to say this. I started in 1995 with Rainbow Works. That was my, because 94 was our democracy. We all had hope. And so in 95, I said, okay, I'm in Johannesburg. I will go and teach in Bosmont. So I got people like uh, June van Meer, who were all, all my active friends 
to go in there and teach on a Saturday. So it was Soweto kids from Soweto, Bosmond, um, was it Westbury, outside. Also troubled kids, but they loved performing. So when I moved to Cape Town, I, I had this, I was taken up as a judge. Everybody called me and said, we're doing shopping mall contests. <laughs> Won't you be a judge? So I said, yeah, I will. And I went to Mitchell's Plain. And I looked at these kids and I thought, you know, you will come every year, you will enter this competition, but nobody's telling you it's the wrong song. It's the, the wrong partner you're singing with. You're not looking, you know, you need to look good on stage. Nobody's teaching you that. And that is where the first applause show start came from. I then pitched it to Artscape, to um, Simon. Simon took it to Marlene, and Marlene said, yes, we'll give you space. I did one week training. That was in the first thing. One week training, and Artscape gave me a venue to perform in with these kids. We had 14 of them. Felicity Biffle. Felicity B is now one of the big singers also on, on the circuit. South side, they they out in Spain. They come in and out of South Africa. They tour most of the time. My daughter Talia, she's in Italy. She's she's now a solo artist and she flies all over the world. Um, Grand Perez, as well. He's also a solo artist and he's also outside of the country. So that training helped them during that time. And 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 for me, we can do so much more. You know, when it comes to funding, that's where it's a zero. You have to go with cap in hand. You're struggling to get money, to get funding for training, for shows, for productions. Our most recent one is Solo Africa, where we bring in um, international artists to tell, come and tell solo stories, you know. We, on our side in South Africa, it is... We're telling our own story. I have my own personal story to tell, and the people that we train, we get them to tell their stories. Because in telling your story, you start healing. And, and you also start healing um, your, your people. So for three years, we have had no funding. Marlene has come on board as an as associate with the venue. But... It is a struggle. I always say to people, NGO, NPO, NPC, you can have it, yes, but the funding is non-existent. We do not even know about critical skills in our arts and culture, in our creative industry. We need to find out where we need to train to give them the skills and where we don't need to train. Everybody's got, everybody, there's lots of community groups. How do we bring them under one umbrella where we can give them the necessary skills? So it's been a long haul. You know, um, applause started in 2002. What's it now? 17 years, Marlene. It's been a long walk. And freedom is not in sight yet. It's also the sad part of it is we are subsidizing, even with our little bit that we have, we are subsidizing development in this country. I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. All right. A round of applause to Ms. Natalia Da Rosa. Thank you very much for that one, Natalia. Very key message that comes out there, ladies and gentlemen, um, and I think the one that speaks to a vital point, you know. Um, are we really free? Um, and the questions, are, and it speaks very much to our theme too, you know. Um, is the art, although manageable, really succeeding? Um, although we have, we've heard quite a few lessons that one can learn from the challenges faced by Ms. De Rocha, and it's lessons that are key. Um, lessons that speak to the fact that within the circumstance of those who have nothing or young children, there is indeed opportunities of growth there is indeed success stories that can be told out of what they are willing to provide and give 
It was a country, but I'm going to come back to you, uh, Mr. Roshak. I guess not TV with full presenter, you know, live on USA. So I'm going to come back to you, ma'am. Um, I'm going to move to the next panelist, ladies and gentlemen. I was going to say, Gwatinta Bafaz, Gwatinta Bogoto. But then again, let me not be that way, you know. Let me let it flow in that way, because we don't want a reality where now I'm being told that, hey, Yabonage, cultural, we are more shaking. You're not doing the right thing. So, ladies and gentlemen, an honor I have of knowing this gentleman, very much personally so. Um, a true, true reflection of what is great. A true reflection of that lesson that you spoke about, Mr. Rosha, about how there's nothing and you become something. Um, Aldo, to me, I, I still call him Uncle Luyanda, which in our language is obviously Talucha or Put Luyanda. A great story to be told, but I'm not going to tell myself, that he will tell himself. We met on a youth program known as the High Schools Program. It's a youth initiative aimed at building holistic leadership via capacity, capacity building workshops with the aim of creating and, you know, creating and bringing about young leaders from different schools to help them create initiatives and programs to tackle and, you know, the social challenges that we face in and around our schools. So, ladies and gentlemen, he's all the way from Cry for Cry for. They don't say Cry Fontaine anymore. It's Cry for, you know. He's from Cry Fontaine, that one township and you and, and settlement, informal settlement area that has a lot of famous places. France, what other places are there? Country places, France. I mean, someone asked me, Carlo, where are you off to? I want the taxi going to Barcelona. Barcelona? <laughs> You know, so people don't know that people don't know in Yanga. Next, I don't know if you know if you drive from the airport that if you, to, you turn from the airport to your right, Borja Quarry, and you're onto the N2 on your left hand side, that settlement that is Barcelona. So, please, it's great. And Lusaka, you know, Zambia. So, they're next to the gravesite at the cemetery, so it is Barcelona. Ladies and gentlemen, please, a warm, warm welcome to Mr. Luyanda Notilinga. Good afternoon. My name is Luyanda Notilinga. I am from Cryfontein. While I was listening to Umama next to me, I was thinking, okay, what am I going to say? And then, like, he is talking about the, I think, success stories about arts. So what I can say, I started arts when I was in primary school. Actually, I think I was forced <laughs> to do arts. Because uh, my friend, when I think I was doing grade two that time, he forced me to do, uh, uh, he says it's called two-hander. But that I didn't even know what is two-hander. So <laughs> he took me, he gave me some lines that we will rehearse and perform in the school hall. Then he went and sit there and perform. People loved it. So that was the first show I did in front of the lots of people. And then I said, no, it's fine. I didn't could deal with that. So as I grew up, I always had an interest of being a social worker. Mm. And as you grew up, it always changes what you want and, and, and so forth. But when I came to Cape Town, uh, I was introduced to soccer. I was very good in soccer, but I realized that I, I, I think I love uh, speaking to people more than playing soccer. Then I, like when I go to high school, I joined a, 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 a debating team. I mean, my English was not good. So I was always the one who was doing the research and everything, but I was never the one who was sitting to do the debating. Then I heard there's a drama society. Or in my school, I joined the drama. I started now going to rehearsals and everything. So I remember the first performance I did when I was in school was in 2005. And my first performance, because the same was in art, you don't keep the back to the audience when you perform. <laughs> so when I perform, we're playing like the dice and everything. So I gave the back to the audience while I was doing that. And then I was cri criticized for that. Okay. So moving on from that. In in Cryfontein, I'm coming from from 2007, 8, 9, there was no drama organization in the community. So as I was studying Hector Peterson, we decided that when we matriculated, the guys that started in Light of Life with, we, matri we matriculated in 2007, and I matriculated in 2008. So to we said, okay, guys, since we did drama at school as an extramural, what can we do now to continue what we did at school? Then we started to to come together, conceptualize and talking about what can we do. 
then we decided let's open our own arts organization. So actually in 2009, that was the revolution of arts in Greifontein, especially in Owala Skin and Blue Gom Boston. We started to, to form a light of life theatre organization. And then the other groups called Maibu, we started uh, four months after us, and then other groups started to join now. I think we've got plus ten plus minus ten organizations now at the moment in, in, in Greyfontein. So we're one of those oldest organizations starting from two oh nine. They were before us, but the revolution started in our time. So while we were busy now uh, starting light of life, like uh, community wise, you have your your Athlon, your Cape Town, your Kailicha, your Nyanga. Those are already well established uh, communities in, in, in terms of arts. So we're always uh, not competing as much, but competing with Kailicha because every time there's a performance in Kailicha, we always shiver like ish. <laughs> We're gonna get that there's good actors and everything there. So we started uh, engaging and having shows. So one of those weak organizations when we attended those uh, festivals and everything, they were bad <laughs> when we started. We we're always coming out as the last organization. But we didn't lose faith. We continued to have people coming in, helping with us, and it started to become a, a household a community organization. So from 2013, that was the breaking point for the organization to grow. So, because at that time we we participated in Zabalaza Festival in Baxter, we did good. Then we managed also to to go to Artscape to be part of the high school drama festival. So the first time where we 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 entered uh, Artscape High School Drama Festival, we won the festival. So we we're so excited, like okay, we can do this thing. Because we always was when we were in school. We always was no, there's one performance that every year that you need to look up to because you need to go to perform in August in Artscape High School Drama Festival. I think that's a festival that launched lots of uh, artists, especially in, 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 in Cape Town, because when you perform in Artscape in that festival, it gives you a platform to look more where to, to do grow and everything. So first time we entered, we won the festival, then we started now to continue going to Artscape, going to Zabalaza Festival in Baxter, grew the organization. So part of talking about the, the success story, in 2016, we participated in Zabalaza. Luckily, in Artscape, they started a program called Incubator Program, I think, in 2016. So I was lucky to, to, to be in connection with one of the uh, guys who were part of that Incubator Program. So he told me I must I must connect with U Uplastics. May he so rest in peace. I s uh, every time <laughs> Mama Maling <laughs> every time we go to <laughs> high school travel festival we're scared of plastics. <laughs> the the way he was. <laughs> so when they told me I must make an appointment, I was like, Ish, what am I going to say to that man? <laughs> and I was like three hours late <laughs> to that meeting. Because uh uh no. <laughs> so so when I go there, actually uh, Metro Rail, obvious was he's got a, a good story about Metro Rail, like <laughs> delaying and stopping in the process. <laughs> so the train stops at 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 not Quebec, yeah, at Quebec. So from Quebec, I had to walk from Quebec, uh, Salt River, Woodstock, and Cape Town. So I walked there. So when I get to Arts Cape, Prastix was already out of the office. I saw him getting out on the wheelchair, coming out of the space. I'm like, uh, hey, follow Tata. I was coming to see. So no, 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 no. I said one o'clock. Now it's three o'clock. I'm going home. So <laughs> I had to reschedule with him. I was scared of him already. I rescheduled with him. Then I made time I spoke and said, no, it's fine. We're going to open the call in July for the incubator. Then I came. We, we sent our details. Then we were called for the interviews we are part of the incubator program. The reason I'm talking about the incubator program is that it's one of those programs that has launched us in terms of being a, a arts administrator. Because as, an, as, as artists, you always tend to go to the stage, rehearse, put a production, perform, and go home. 
ASCAP will give you 200,000 or 100 production for that two month. That's it. You are done, you are paid. There's no legacy behind now how to run the organization and everything. So in that program, we were trained for the full year on how to run your arts organization with everything. So being part of the incubator program, it trained us to know how to to run a proper organization. What is the proper documentation that you need, like your your NPO, your your tax registration and everything. So being in the incubator program, we manage, I must be honest to say, success story. Out of that 2017, we came out with two projects that were funded as being part of the incubator program. We funded about the Western Cape Federation. First time getting 45,000, like, yes, yes. Can we get this amount of money? Then it was given to us. We were funded also by Learning Trust, came to us being part of the incubator program. So we were really dedicated to part of that program. So as, as also being part of that, it helped us as the organization now to, to know where to look for funding and more. As I'm sitting here now, there is a, a musical production we are doing as Light of Life Theatre Organization. We we applied from Lotto. We didn't know anything about Lotto, so I came to Artscape again this year. So they had a, a I don't know, call it an open day whatsoever. So we came there, they explained what is the process in order to get funding from Lotto. We tick all the boxes that was needed because of the incubator program. We tick right boxes. Then actually we funded, not exact amount we were looking for, but we said no, half a loaf is better than nothing. So, so from what they gave us, we started now to do a, a skills program uh, training for three months. So from there, we then we do a, a musical production as part of what to train the, the young the, the young actors now to do. So as I'm talking now, we opened our show yesterday, a musical production called. Uh, so we didn't say we're going to do this as light of life. As I said, we have got plus one as ten organizations said, no, this is about Krefontein. So we called all the groups that come, guys, audition your kids to be part of the program. They came. We have 26 actors in the production who are doing a musical production that's running at this moment, I'm talking, because after this, I will go back with a show that's starting at 6, finishing on Wednesday, the on, on Wednesday from six o'clock, Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday, and today. So we're skipping tomorrow. It's a church day, so <laughs> we must go and, and thank that guy. <laughs> he's, he's up there. So it's a success story to say that we at least now we are able now to 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 mobilize ourselves and put all the documentation in order to say now in arts, if you don't have all these things, you're not gonna win. But at the end of the day, Artscape uh, Baxter market theater, they need to have documentation in order to have you on their stage because they have to report at the end of the day. If you don't register, no one is going to look at you and say, okay, we can give you this, 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 and that. So we're in that platform and say, no, it's a success story we have as organization. Thank you. Leander, no Lingala, ladies and gentlemen. Great story. Um, and I think it's, it's one of those stories, just like Miss Natalia's, that we don't have to, you know, point out the key word, success, lesson, and how the arts is managed. It just shows you there is someone who's gone through much, who's learned the lessons, who's managed his own ability within the arts framework and with the arts fraternity. And now he is the success story of that great arts initiative. I think you failed to mention that you guys won the Zabalaza. Is it Zabalaza? We, we won the <laughs> when the Zabalaza started in 2011. Like, you know, in the community, like, organization, we are always being labeled, we are being called, you guys are the ambassadors of the Zawalaza Festival. Since 2011, we never won the festival, but we've been participating all the years. So t 2019 was an actual a, a break year for us. We won the Zawalaza, and we are the first organization to won Zawalaza Festival, and then we were taken out of the province to perform in the Free State, they call it uh, Free St Free Start. Yes, festival. It's, uh, it's an African festival. So we're taken there by uh, Bester Theatre to perform there. So it's a, it's a very huge success story that we, we can talk about. So they enjoy themselves. Luckily, I was not part of the cast because there are two productions. And on that, what we're saying, 
we we entered the two productions and both of both of those productions were nominated as the best production the Zabalaza Festival. So we're like, okay, if 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 uh, the system doesn't win, then uh, Ukuwa is gonna win. So there were two of us in one category. Said no, if one is losing, definitely the one is winning. Then we won with the with the Ukuwa Gwengaba. So we're taken there. So now the, the 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 big chance now is for us, as I said, to to work more to go now to Grimstown Festival. We've done Baxter, we've done Upcape, we've done Market Theatre. So now we need to do State Theatre. We actually want to do all the big theatres in South Africa. We want to go now to Grimstown National Festival. But next year, raining or winding. Is it winning? <laughs> winding. Go to Upcape again, put a production there. So those spaces are for us to, to utilise as young people. Thank you. Thank you very much. A round of applause to Leandro Tilinga. Marlene, I hope you get the hint, eh? So don't even try it next year, eh? Space is all for light of life. Space is all. I mean, if we don't give it to light of life, where will we get light for life? So let's, let's just ensure that happens. Do you now see why he says I'm not arts and he's arts? Because he wants to manage my talent of being a host and a what what in order for me to recognize his arts. I see this thing. So ladies and gentlemen, your, your next panelist and obviously your final one, of course, I, I, I called her early on the Lala Hathaway of South Africa. And she was like, oh my God, Nicola, you like to you like to be so, you know. And um, I call that because she brings about this authi word authenticity. Is that the right word? You know, I must, I, must, I must watch out what I say because raw, raw, you know, the tongue, you know, the English. So she brings about that element, that great, unique element in her. Then you lucky, to lucky, Marlene and Stephen. So she brings about this great element in her. And it's something admirable. Um, I watched the first music video on SABC3 each and every time. And the song comes on, turn up the volume, I love you to death, you know. And I'm like, yeah, this is my number, the over the number, people spill my car. And then she hit the stage of one of our former legendary artists who's passed on. May his soul rest in peace, Moses Dai Wamulelekwa. I know I'm young, but I love his music, a pianist of note. She headlined his stage, indeed, on a Friday evening, if I'm correct, my memory serves me right, at the Cape Town International Jazz Festival. And there was Oriel Hayes performing and doing what she does best. But ladies and gentlemen, she hasn't stopped working on her sixth album. Her music is indeed used to advocate, you know, for a lot of initiatives in South Africa, more so for social justice. But she also advocates for TLC and those with Alzheimer's. They're very near to her heart. Um, and she's been with me to Toulouse, France. To both of them, actually. We both went to Toulouse, France. We both went, sorry, uh, Mama Marlene. So, I mean, she was there and she made South Africa proud. I think we all did. We sang, we collaborated. We performed in a very, very old Catholic church in France, a chapel. No longer a chapel, but they drink in the chapel and they party in the chapel. No need to worry. It's one of those x men scenery churches where everything is broken, demolished, but it has this... This jam vibe, there's music, there's seating, there's, uh, there's everything. So trust us as South Africans who are jet lagged to sleep first for five hours before we performed. And people are like coming in thinking we're part of the artwork as a little twit. Leave her as a little twit. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you none other than a lady who's also been nominated for much of her music too in many, many different categories. Down to earth and beautiful, elegant and eloquent. Sorry, Mum Natalia, you two are beautiful. And you know I'm exaggerating now. Please, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so I don't want to get a hiding from Natalia Delarosa. Um, so indeed, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Please, a warm welcome to Miss Oriel Hayes. Um, it's interesting because my, my journey is so similar and so different from yours. Um, my mother always said to me, Kali, you are in the wrong profession. You should have been a therapist. And the reason why she says that, and I think all of my friends know this about me, I mean, even if you take me to a gay club and I have a little talking in me, I will be in a corner there talking to someone and my notebook will be out and I will be writing. Um, I was very privileged to be part of this reclaiming agency event from the beginning. And what struck me yesterday, because we watched My Dear Children, and... Um, I said, you know, when it was finished, I, I ran out because I, I, I needed to cry. And of course, I have a little cigarette. Um, and then when, as soon as I got home, I started writing. 
um, I found music or music found me very late in life. And I wasn't part of the church. I'm very much a loner, to be quite honest. And it has made my journey a lot harder. I would like to think that's one of the reasons why my voice sounds the way it does, why I am able to articulate things the way I do. Um, interestingly enough, it has been individuals that have shaped my journey. Um, I would speak to um, Noel Daniels over there that has opened my eyes to a lot of very interesting people and so, um, yeah, social justice causes. So he's, I've always been very influenced by the individual, not by the group. Um, when it comes to me in a group setting, I'm usually the one that is talking to everyone in the corner by themselves, making sure that they're okay. That's, that's, that's my strength. I'm very good with one-on-one -on -one and finding their stories and then sharing it with music. And the one thing that was very profound that was said to me was by um, Zeke Singa. So I wrote, I wrote this song called um, In My Lover's Bed. Very, very personal. And he was, when I write music, I send it to people I trust first. You know, there you go, listen to the song. These people know me so well that even if I use the same chord structure, they will say, Keki, that sounds no. And you know, uh -uh, don't do that. And you can't write a song where you're whistling all the time, stop it. Um, so I sent the song to him. And I was very nervous because that was one of the songs that was very emotional to write. And then he said something to me which really changed everything. He said to me, my, my darling, if you can't tell your own story and be honest about your own story, how can you tell the story of others? And so now I do consider myself as a musical storyteller. And the reason why I mentioned the importance of this initiative by Cornerstone was that I sort of realized there are so many, there are so many different ways that you can reclaim yourself, your power, your, there are different ways that you can do that. Everyone here, um, my friends, and, and maybe I would like to get to know better, <laughs> um, their journeys are so unique and they have had the privilege of, of being groomed and so I speak for the loner out there. I speak for the little weirdo, you know, I, I, because that's, that's what I am. And I know that there are so many people who are on the fringes. And so when I engage with them, the only thing I'm interested in is like, hey man, tell me, let's talk, you know. Um, it's always a bonus if there's whiskey, but you know, you spit it for water. <laughs> so, and, and that's the one thing that, I, that I'm very, very passionate about. It's what fuels everything I do. Um, when someone, I think I mentioned it in a bit of writing, that every artist, you have to know what success feels like. So sure, you can go and read my biography, and yes, it is impressive, but what, what does that mean, you know? When I sit and I do something, whether it is a show, whether I make money or not, and I know that's one of the things we have to, to speak about, the only thing that goes through my mind always is how true am I being to the person sitting in front of me? How true am I being in reflecting what it is they are saying? And if I can walk away from any experience, any show, I know that I have been true in the sharing of my story, their story, and the music, then I have been successful. Um, I'm very passionate about TLC Alzheimer's, TLC Alzheimer's um, homes out in Sedgefield, because again, that is something that has shifted the way that I look at the world. We all have problems with our, with our parents, you know, some of us still daddy and mommy issues. But the minute that I was in that space, I realized, yeah, there's a point at which you have to step back and you have to really see people. That was the big lesson because people who have Alzheimer's no longer know who they are. They are stuck somewhere. 
And so if you step into that space with that pain that you carry because you can't let go of that person, you're not seeing this person who they are right now. And that, again, that was something that shifted my thinking is that when someone is in front of me, even though, let's say, I've known them for years, can I see who they are right now in this second? Can I cut off whatever past was there and then tell that story? So that is, that's when I engage with, and I do mentor some, some of the kids, and I would then refer them to the panelists over here, and I say, you know what? If you want those answers, brah, Go and Google. Do it. But if you're sitting in front of me, I want to know who you are. I want to know why you want to get up and, and sing. Why you want to get up and write. Are you doing it because you want to look quiet? Are you doing it for validation? And I have turned away students for, I have turned them away. I was like, no, man, go. I'm not, I'm not interested in having a conversation with you. Because if there's no depth, then what am I doing? You know, then go and have fun and sing and use music for something else. Because I know I was a very, very shy child. I was very, very sheltered. Like I said, music came to me very, very late. So I take it very seriously. It's a calling. So if I'm going to engage with someone, it's going, we are going to go deep and we're going to go dark. So that no matter what happens to you in this artistic field, you are able to cope. You're able to cope. Yeah, thank you. Miss Oriel Hayes, ladies and gentlemen. You know, and every time when I when I see, I always make the effort of not just saying Oriel, Ariel, you know. I make it a point of being like, Oriel, Oriel, how are you? Are you okay? Are you good? So that's that's our Oriel Hayes, gentlemen. A talent right here from Cape Town, South Africa. Um, passionate about what she does. And I think what's also significant about the successful things about art and about how the management thereof is is that this panel is people who have succeeded and done great and done well, but have not forgotten their roots, have not forgotten where they come from, and are still passionate about the grass, grassroot issues of our society, passionate about the challenges that many, many young people and any other person in society faces. So this is why I said this is a diverse panel, ladies and gentlemen. You can clearly tell from what we have. So I'm not going to waste any further time. Um, I'm going to move over into the circle um, and to getting any questions from the floor or engagements to the panel. I've noted a hand right at the back. Thank you, Chair. Um, this funding, this funding um, problem has been with the arts people as long as I can know. And I admire you for your um, tenacity, this, your lung, your barn, and so on and so on. And somebody phoned the other day and they said they're tired of Mr. I'm not going to discuss personalities. They said the, the, the current minister is a minister of condolences. And that, that's all that he does. So, Sorry. I'm not, and, and then, my, my, my question is, what, 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 um, what w in what way can we challenge the status quo and say, you know what, for too long, have we been lamenting on the trial, on the protest and what and so on, and it fell on deaf ear. Uh, two months ago, a couple of weeks ago, there was this, uh, uh, um, um, after she wrote a letter, open letter to Dangas and saying how they are being abused by, 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 by this so-called famous couple and this one, this guy. And they were in, in, in exile with the people and they came back and they blacked and they treat them worse than the apartheid sorry, people treat them with, as far as money is concerned. So my question is, what more can we do to, 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 to once and for all address this funding crisis of the arts? That's number one. Number two is, Mr. Chair, but your two stemming. Can you even say in the fair verlede, you must be a gemeenschappelijke voorouder met the beroemde Dr. Daniel van Schoen-Malan. I'm All right, my word. 
All right, that's indeed the limit. Ik weet het toch? Ik, 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 mijn land is nou niet het voordeel, maar ik weet het. Misschien moet ik het opzoeken doen en navraag doen. Misschien ken iets iets wat ik niet ken. Ik kan voor iets zeggen in mijn plan. Ik ga zie heb gekoop verkeerd, zie heb gekoop. Hij moet bingo gekoop het. Misschien zal ik gaan hakken. Maar te koop en nu surfen. Hij is been surfing all the way. So misschien gaat iets mee jaar met iets. So so there's one, there's one, there's one aspect that comes up, and that's a key one. So let me go over to you panelists. In as much as I want to also engage that point um, and as you can hear I think the first one speaks a lot to, to, to the current status quo the challenge is that a lot of the concerns that arise and unfortunately it always goes around funding it's always around the money the money will always be the first buck because we needed to sustain programs we needed to sustain initiatives I think the first debate was clear in the f in the past it was always that have programs sustain yourselves you are sustaining yourselves now but however the finance still becomes a challenge and there's a clear indication I mean with Vatis and Dacha Going out there, speaking vocally about the treatment and how artists are treated. Give us a little bit medical benefits, but okay. No VTEC book, and I shall advocate. You see, that's why I'm here. I'm a law student also, so I must advocate for these things in future. But panelists, on this issue, how do we come together? And how do we build a path that is different and alternative that finds us fixing this this, this concern around finance? Okay, um, I, I was on the commission for three years, once, and as a group, it was the first time that they had all NGO, people that have been in uh, arts and culture and running their own companies. Okay. So we looked at what the, 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 they were giving five and 10,000 Rand to groups. What can you do with five and 10,000 Rand? You can do absolutely nothing. We came in and said 30,000 should be the minimum that you can give them for a project if, if it's a small company, if that's what they want. So I would say that we need to push for more funding in as arts and culture in that way. Because now we, you know, I don't know, I don't know how they divide it, whether it's oh, X amount of 35 million or X or 100 million or what, but you also, everything falls under, then you have the what they call the big five. The big five, I don't know if they're still around, but the big five, the opera and the ballet and the orchestra and I don't know, whatever it is, they get 50% um, or more of that funding. And then there's a very little for community development, for all the other organizations. So you cannot ask for 150 or 200,000 rand for a project. You cannot. You won't get it. You know. So what we've got to ask for is that they make that money more. Yes, the opera is there. Yes, the ballet is there. Yes, you know those those the orchestra is there. They do need funding. What we've got to find out, say, is we need more for grassroots training. For when we're talking about funding is not I mean for the 19 years I think I got 70,000 Rand from the Western Cape 70 so maybe a hundred thousand Rand all in all from the Western Cape 19 years the other money came from my husband's pocket <laughs> you know so how, d how do we because we believe in what we do we will do it for nothing, but there comes a time when you need to have, you need to pay your rent, you need to have have uh, petrol in your tank, the e electricity and stuff like that. Those are all things that we teach our children. You know, when, when I do, how do you put a budget together for yourself? First, put a budget together for yourself. How much does it cost for me to be in my household? And then, then you can't have people doing it for nothing or running an organization with no money. So, I mean, uh, it is, it's something that we're fighting. I have not been very vocal in, because I, I lost my faith in, in fighting in big groups since SIFSA. I just took a walk away. But we need to get together as artists, but really, 
and with no other agenda but to make things happen on the ground. Because there are too many egos that's running. And they the people that come in. And, you know, yeah, it's a bit, bit sad. <laughs> Over to you, Taluta, on that view on what way forward. Yeah. As a young person, it's difficult sometimes to to represent uh, the older generation. But I think for us as young people this time, we need to organize ourselves. I will go back to the incubator program that was done by Artcape, Market Theatre, uh, Playhouse, yeah, and, and State Theatre. For that program, really helped us to, to be able to run organizations. Because for us as artists, we always think about me going to stage and perform, uh, and, and, and that's it. So now, like for, 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 for this problem we're facing now with Umami is that our generation need to, to know all the measures that are there. For the example, if we talk about royalties and, 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 and signing the contract and everything, so we need to know about things like that. Because now when, when we write about the story about Umami Fatiswa, she wanted a million, then she went down to 700,000. But the SOP now gave her 70,000. But we don't know how much does the SOP generate when the, the, the show is aired, like, uh, like we are, we are, it's a third season now. So there's millions that are being made. So they, they, there's no emphasis on the artists on how to save. I know what amount are you making now? Because like, if you shoot something, you shoot it now, like, 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 like now in November. It's going to air maybe in December next year. You, you, you got paid now. So now the society have got now. Uh, when they see you on TV now in November next year, they're like, ah, you have money now, but you've already paid your peanuts now. So that show is coming that time later. So what I, what I want to say is that if we can try, especially for the younger generation, to give more emphasis on, on training us on how to manage ourselves, on how to know what is it that we can do in order to, to, to know when you sign a contract, what are you binding yourself and everything. So it will help you now to go forward as an artist. At the end of the day, South Africa needs to change. And like other countries, art must be taken as a, a, a as a serious thing because we not cannot be treated as a, as, as an extra mura because part of the government budget, arts, I think arts only get maybe 1% of the total budget that is given by the government. But in, if you don't invest in young people now, because not all of us are going to be doctors, Yes, we've got lots of junkies and drugs and everything now because young people have got nothing to do. Because if you know this child can sing, push her to the, to the, to the school that can train her to sing and make money even while she or he is in primary school and everything. But because in South Africa, we're always, we're always late. At 21, now you want to go to university to start music. Your vocal cords and other things are not well shaped anymore. Now. But if you start at that younger generation, you can have a better society going forward. Thank you. I think I think it, it really does come back to education. Um, we need to really redefine. We, we all know that music and art, that there's value to it. But take a look at what the kids are actually listening to. So you need to ask them, what is this music that you're listening to? You need to link it. You need to give it greater value. And it starts when they're that small because those little kids, they're watching the television and the music is being bastardized. The television, it's, it's the biggest load of crap. And so their minds have, have already been damaged in terms of how, what art is and how to express it. So if it's, and I agree, this artist should get together but there's a completely other layer to it, and it, it's, it's foundational. It really, really is. It's about giving art the, the meaning. And, and especially if you think about South Africa, I mean, what was, what was um, it used for? It was used to protest. Yeah, it w that's what it was used for. Um, that kind of value it has to be reinstalled because there are many things to be upset about. There are many injustices that need to be addressed. But again, for me, it is about educa education and saying like, okay, this is th that's the crap music you listen to, and we're going to show you. We're going to show you the magic of it. 
because if it starts there, then it would get reflected on the televisions, and then, do you, do you see what I'm saying in terms of the, the knock-on effect? Wow. All right, so I'll move over again to the floor. Um, I just have to hope that we are still within the time, because I know originally <laughs> we were to be done by four, so let's just go through it quickly. I'll go first with Marlene, and then I'll go to you, ma'am, then I'll come to you, ma'am, and then I'll see the ma'am here with the purple. I think I want to put it a little bit in context. Forget about where I come from now. Now I'm going to talk about the complexity. It's, we had an act-tag process. Let me take you back a little bit. Where previously, if we look at our landscape as the arts, there was the theater was, there was the drama company, there was that previously. Then we had act-tag. And we, as activists, we then mobilize that the theater is out totally on its own. Then we will have funding organizations to level the playing fields. So as artists, we expected artists to at least mobilize, like, like you have done, in order. That's why we started the incubated process. We, we were the only, and we are still the only theater that has a resource center. Okay? And the resource center specifically was based on the basis of where we come from. Because we need to know, if you know your history, you can reclaim so that it doesn't happen again. Okay? The resource center was mainly started because of the cultural commission. There are laws that is governed that is sometimes not conducive for the people. The Public Management Financial Act. Let me start with that. The Treasury Regulations. The tax law. We didn't have a tax certificate. Am I right, brother? Ne? All of that. Ne? So, my good grief. So, we've realized, my good grief, our artists will never be able to perform if they need to have all of these things. We started the resource center. Then, secondly, there was the National Arts Council. Then, that should be in full operation in order for people in categories because arts are in categories. You are a contemporary artist or you're a classical artist. Everybody should have been equal. Or you are a ballet dancer, a contemporary dancer, what I can go on and on. Okay? You then have the right if you are constituted correctly. You've mentioned that. Whether uh, when you accompany, I want to just I just want to be clear and then I would like to end off actually by saying why it is so important to have a relook at arts management as per se, because the tertiary, the curriculum to train artists in all sphere should change people, okay? It should change totally, okay? That should have been fully organized. Then we have BASA, for instance. Then we have the cultural commissions. Then we have the lottery, which has a category for people to apply. Am I correct, sister? Yeah? So, if those things don't administratively don't work properly for the people and it becomes bureaucracy with papers that you need to fill in so thick, then it is not going to work for us. Whether you artist, whether you a person that's looking, we are in the gender-based violence month, with its civil society, it's our laws are working against us. Secondly, I would like to say is that when you're an artist, you're first and foremost, you're an entrepreneur. This is what you work with. You need to know project management. You know, need to know what is a budget. You need to know in order how to negotiate. Leave that agents. You need to know it yourself. You need to know if you write a, a song orally. Are uh, um, are you registered? Are you going to register? Nah? That's why we say the minister's condolences because first and foremost, we need to pay for the funerals because the artist doesn't register their work. That's why there's Samro. Is Samro operating correctly? There's Dauro. Is Dauro operating correctly? Because if you're writing a script, so there I can go on and on and on. We need to obey ourselves, organize ourselves properly so that you can step into the space and start to argue not from an emotional basis, but from a perspective basis and from a knowledgeable basis. And then you need to say, if 
that person has, who has been appointed to be the CEO is not working out, you must go. You must really go. Because you are an obstruction. Okay? Because very important, now that we were sport, we now a department for sports, arts and culture. Yes, yes, yes. Let us just take that a little bit. Oh, I'm really going to lose my job, but I must talk about that. I must, I must talk about it. Sports are organized. I just want to say to you, yeah, they've got clubs. They're 100% organized, man. So I want to say, organize yourself. Yeah? So if you get for a gig 30,000 rand to sing two songs, hello, go invest your money, man. Don't cry afterwards. Yeah? The reason why I'm saying this is that we now, it's the time now. We need to say to Natalia, Natalia, we have failed you. We have failed you so many Natalias we failed. You should have had a company that has been fully operated and should have toured this country first and not just tour overseas. That's, that's, that's our main thing. Then we need to say, why is this budget like this and not like that? It's extremely important elements. We can't just see ourselves as being just social awareness. We need to have that. But if I'm a brilliant singer, I first and foremost want to be a brilliant singer. And I want to be recognized as a singer or a dancer. And not only to be invited to sing for a course. Finish a clan now, man. Yeah? We can't just be gig or, or, or orientated. We should regard the arts as a science. So two things I want to leave at the cinema with, and to leave it with Cornerstone in particular. Number one, the education department from pre-primary should start with arts as a subject, with skills trained teachers back into the schools. Okay? Very important. Because the rudiments of reading is exactly the rudiments of music. If you can read music, you can become a jazz artist, contemporary singing, you can write your songs, all of it. Then you are not, I'm just making up one genre, you're then not dependent on. Bonita was privileged to be in those schools where you pay a lot of money to have a music teacher. Let us level the playing fields there. Then the second factor is that when you go to universities, is to unpack what students should have in order to equip them, not only to be stars. I just want to be clear. We need arts administrators. My God, somebody must take over my job. Okay? Yeah? You need to be able to know how you're going to run a theater if you can't even run yourself. Because a theater has different components. You need to know finance. You need to know the Health and Safety Act. You need to know exactly project management. You need to be able to know the finance terms that we're talking about. You need to be able. It's got nothing to do with the arts. The arts is the last thing on that. That's why we started the incubator pro program for you to come to understand hello. If you run a company, you need to know what is a worksheet. You need to know what is a technical writer. You need to know how is that, what is that light going to cost? That's why I'm sitting with Sister Bonita to say, Sister Bonita, you got money perhaps, but maybe that money is not enough. Ne? So in order for you, you need to be equipped people. It's about that. So it's a re-look. So a drama student who sometimes has a master's comes to the theater. No, you all, you have studied music. The curriculum is about to become a concert pianist. There you are. Perhaps only one out of 50 is a concert pianist. So I'm pleading to Cornerstone. If we want to reclaim agency, you will need to reclaim our curriculum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Marlene. Not only a very, very vital source of information, a character rook, you know, can see Artscape cannot lose Umalin at all. If we lose Malin, 
we lose that aspect, you know. But yeah, but you can see things are changing. She's always talking about naughty. We could open a text if naughty, but so talk about naughty. <laughs> you, you know, naughty. So over to you, ma'am. Um, before I get to my second word, my last. Oh, you are covered. No, thank you very much. I'm going to eat lunch. Eat lunch on Sunday. Eat lunch. Yeah, what? No, you may go. Yeah, okay. Let's go. Um, so hi, my name is Shakira. Uh, my company's name is Lack Network, and we provide creative and artistic services to corporates, and we train um, aspiring creatives with the soft skills that need, like being versatile, being creative, etc., to be able to work with these corporates. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Um, so I, I was making quite a bit of notes, and some of it's covered, so I'm just going to go through them, and we can pick up if we want. Um, Uriel, I really loved what you said about valuing the arts. Um, I'm very intimidated to be sitting in this group of esteemed people who have been working in the industry. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I really um, resonated with what you said about, because I feel like as a country, and particularly our government, doesn't value the arts. Uh, and you can see that with many bills. I mean, I work a little bit in the book industry also, and then there's the copyright amendment bill, which also doesn't, you know, that says on its own, we don't value your work, you know? Um, and then the fact that also with the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture, that also says we don't value the arts. And I think that's one of the biggest problems in that, that there's no value in it. Um, and then on the, on the funding side of it, um, just a little bit of insight from my personal experience. Uh, not much, but I have found um, so a little bit of support from the private sector in terms of funding, but that's only because I studied PR and I have a marketing background, and so I'm able to speak the lingo that the, that the private sector wants to hear in terms of, you know, yeah, I can give you the marketing return on investment, and we're going to be here, and I can write press releases, and I can put you on our social media, and, and I know all of that lingo, you know, but what about someone who doesn't? That, I always think about that. But um, when you do know, sometimes you can get a little bit of money from the private sector. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to put that out there. Um, and then, so two questions now that I have after my statements. The one is on standardization um, of things like fees. So I, here we're talking a lot about sort of music and theater and stuff, but what about things like graffiti? Um, and, and I mean, even graphic design and illustrators, they kind of, usually someone who's a graffiti artist is an illustrator, is a graphic designer. Um, and even dance, you know, when I book artists and the artists that I work with, I can get for the exact same gig a quote of 500 rand and a quote of 5,000 rand and a quote of 15,000 rand for the same job. And so I'm just, I mean, there are obviously places like Safria that put out their standard rates and recommendations, but they're recommendations. And how many people even know that Safria exists, you know? I just came from the privilege talk, and, and I know and I'm aware of the fact that my privilege to be able to go to university and grow up in the house that I grew up gave me the, the skills, you know, to research, to use the internet wisely. And that's how I know a lot of these things. But let's be honest, most South African artists who are coming from townships or wherever they're coming from, they don't have these skills. Um, so standardization, should we be standardizing um, how much we charge for creative services or artistic services, whatever you want to call them? Uh, and then the other thing is around mental health. And I'm, I'm posing that to you in particular because you were talking a lot about sort of going deep and, and getting to understand the person. And I, my personality, I can resonate a lot with that kind of thing. I'm one of those people that was kind of on the fringe and always sort of feeling lonely. And, and with the artists that I work with, I find that I, I, I see art as when you don't know how to express yourself with words, you're expressing it in all these other ways, with my body, with my painting, with my, you know. Um, and a lot of the artists that I work with, they struggle with mental health. And that affects the way that they work. It affects whether they pitch up for meetings, it affects how they're able to produce art. It affects a lot of these things because artists generally are emotional and that's why they need this other outlet that's not language. Um, and so just sort of, in your experience, how you navigated uh, mental health and art, and then the standardization around pricing question. Thank you very much. All right. No, she's covered. She's very much covered. Uh, um, the standardization. Or would you like to go on the mental one quickly? Renee said she's covered. She said she's covered, yes. She's very much covered. 
Yeah, this is just the uh, responses, and then I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping it up. <laughs> yeah, you see, this, this, this thing of not, this thing of not being in all okay. the members, it's, it's very wrong. This thing is very wrong. You know, members, please do us a favor, ma Honorable Mole. Don't accept power because this is your, this is your initiative. <laughs> don't accept power. Don't worry. Yeah, I get the spring queen on that to the Russian okay. Capital Stadium. So, yeah. So, Belarus standardization, uh, it is very, it's not that easy to standardize um, fees. Okay. For me, the, the thing that is why I brought up, we need a skills audit in our industry. Because some of us are trained and some of us are untrained. So how do you s standardize that? You know, and, and this is something, and Marlene uh, touched on it, when you teach uh, performers at university, you've got to give them more information as to when they go out. It's not just being on stage and stuff like that. You must know how to put an invoice together. You must know how to quote. You must know about your fee. That's why I said, do a budget. My first class I give is put a budget together. So then it comes out to 3,000 rand a month that we need to sp I need to earn. So where do you get that 15,000 rand that you thumb suck to say for a performance? You know, so those are the kind of things that, so san standardization, it's, it's difficult. We need definitely a skills audit. Oh, yeah, the thing with uh, mental health is it's a it's a joke, and I think you, we can all attest to this. Um, we are generally thought of as people with problems. <laughs> you know what I mean? And on the one hand, it's, it allows you to get away with certain things. You and you can use it to your advantage. Um, but the 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 cliches and the jokes around mental health it's really really not funny. Um, Within within my within my group, I kn uh, again everything comes back to education. I'm sorry, everything comes back to education. And if we can educate people to say this is what mental um, health or a lack of mental health looks like, let's say for example in an artist, in in a in a dancer, in a, if we know what to look for, then we are better able to to deal with it but many creatives really get away that they don't even get diagnosed because they say, hey man, that's just, you know, she, that's just who she is kind of thing. Um, and that's deeply problematic. And then the only outlet is your work. And people look at your work and they're like, oh my goodness, it's so great. And then you get positive reinforcement for something that is incredibly painful. And that is, that is, that is the biggest problem there or the um th i think it's again i bring um back something that sakes and Gar said to me and it does come back to discipline i'll be very quick um when i first started writing music i wrote a song every day for two years because i wanted to get into the discipline of being able to write so now if i sit with someone i can write a song just like that just because i have trained myself to to do that so if we, again, I'm sorry, it's, it's all about education. Um, so that when people are, when people do have problems, there are resources, there are places, there are people that can help them. Um, and so that people are not in such pain that that is the only way that they can express it. For the stand standardization, yeah, English and myself, <laughs> water and, and oil, yeah. I I I I think we, for me, it, it it's a good thing that you are advocating for. We need to have a, st a standard because you are told you are immediate, you are semi-professional and professional, so there must be a bracket where you all fall to, so that it helps us to know that, okay, if I'm at this level, this is where I'm supposed to be getting, if I'm at this level, this is where I'm supposed to be getting, and there, so that it, it also, on, what we, on education, on the CV that we have, if let's say you have a degree from University of, Univers University of Cape Town or Vets, it must have something to say 
uh, also on, on what you are getting now as an artist and also the experience that you have so that we can have a point I want to reach as artists say no when I'm at that point I know this is what I'm supposed to be getting and also when talk about standardization you always base it more on the performance of artists we forget about the management of the arts because I, I, as I'm sitting here I run I, I'm one of the people who run a lot of live theater organizations so when you have project and everything so when you talk about let's say payments and everything so the people who run the office and everything who write the proposals are the least people who are, who are expected to get a, 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 a bigger incentives rather those who are performing on the stage forgetting that we are the ones who are sweating I'm an artist but I have to change the gears now and go to the office and sit in front of the computer and check and do the paperwork and everything. So now when the man is there, the first thing that comes to mind, okay, we have a project. We're going to pay a uh, artistic director this, actors this and this, this and that. They forget that there's people, in the administrators behind who have been working for this thing. Because now you end up saying, okay, is it worth now to, to just to be an arts manager now? Because now, you know, if you're an artist, say, okay, let's put it like it's a 3.5 that must get a week. 3.5 times 4 is something else. They will say, no, as an office worker, I know 10,000 that will be getting a month. And then now these people are giving them 3.5 a week. We're like, okay, I've done all the hard work and everything now. I'm only getting 10,000. But all these artists are giving them 15,000 for, 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 for a month. So those are things that we need also to, to look into when we talk about standardization so that we put measures so that the people who are working in the office are, are also... Yeah, yeah. Va, yeah. <laughs> so, Mr. Luyanda and English, not very much friends, you know, they're like water and oil. <laughs> very much in that reality. So, I think more than anything else, ladies and gentlemen, be, as we close off and as I sum everything up, I think the very key message that stands out under this theme, lessons and success managing arts in South Africa, I think the message is clear. Message says, in as much as we have arts, as much as is the, as much as there's lessons and the success stories to be told of how art has brought us to freedom, how art has played a pivotal role in telling the stories of our people through the through the horn of Yuma Sikela, through the clicks of Mamiria Makeba, through the trombone of Jonas Ngwangwa, the saxophone of um, Winston Mankunkungozi. You see, I'm 27, but I know my jazz, you know? So, yeah. So, I mean, these stories to be told, Great actors, Vati Swandar, Bong, all of them together. The question still remains Is the arts industry an industry that is organized? And what is the understanding of organizing? And I think Cornerstone must tackle this not only under this theme, but also for future purposes. I think Artscape, many others must come together under one roof and pose this question The arts in an unorganized, complex society of South Africa. The arts in a complex society in South Africa. Unorganized arts. They will probably ask, but, but what are you trying to say? We are unorganized. We'll then break it down. We'll then take it there. So I think it brings about a very much key point. And I think, Luanda, you, are, uh, you, you and Light of Life are on the right path there. Mom, uh, Mom Natalia is also on the right path. <laughs> Amo. Let us all down to, and let's see what production will play in 2020 when we all are not there now in 2019. Let us see what will happen and who will watch TV screens when we are not there. Because we sustain the lives of people. We tell the stories. Why are we then the most taken for granted? You see, Tanuja, I don't have art much, but you need me to advocate these issues. You need me to advocate. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I think we must thank Cornerstone for giving us this opportunity, giving us the opportunity to engage, but more so over to draw the important storyline and link. When I sent Sandy Sir my id op, I raised a very key point to her. I said it was important for me to know that the lessons that we learn is that there is struggles in our society. However, there is no way that you can be an artist and not have anything around you. There's no way you can be a singer, no way you can be a sportsman, no way you can be the event organizer, no way you can be anything without being holistic. And what is being holistic? Holistic is being the Carla Milan, a leader, come from school, RCL, 
part of structures, part of acti activist movements, however Mikalo can sing, so he can bring the message across by calling a group together as a choir, Mikalo can dance, Mikalo can act a bit here and there, I might be just rough on the edges, but the message can come across. In that way, Mikalo not only understands the community as a developer and volunteer thereof, but he has a holistic understanding of what the challenges of our people are, so as to satisfy and ensure that the agenda is one that is inclusive and it's one that's diverse in all forms. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. A round of applause Bravo. to our panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, we can. Yeah, earlier, you know, I didn't mean to cut this short, but the point was we did start with the with another session happening here. Um, and I think they're busy preparing, and then they're going to be coming in. Some of them had sat in. Uh, in this session, and so there was some overlap, which I thought was pretty useful, um, because the next session deals with community development and the professionalization of that whole area. Um, so I thought I'd just say something in between, because I'm not going to be able to stay for that session, uh, because we're preparing for the party tonight that all of you are invited to, and if the message didn't get out sooner, I apologize. But we bought out the house at the Daily Music Show. We bought out the house tonight. So everybody is invited. Everybody, and there's live music. There's the Joey Puri formula of the Daily Music Show with the live band. And there is, you know, there is food and there's wine, local cuisine. And uh, we will be actually doing some closing remarks around the reclaiming agency because Joey Puri and the Daily Music Show is part of the partnership. Um, the Cape Culture Collective um, has been actively involved as well in this partnership. Um, but I just wanted to say something about the fact that this event is being amplified. And I want everybody to know that. That is not just here that this, conversa this conversation is going to end. First of all, as you know, it's been live streamed. Secondly, we have our own video recording done by Joshua, and the media team is taking responsibility for getting that onto our website, getting that onto social media, and spreading the messages that came out of today's conversation beyond this room. There are other um, techniques that we're using, and I'd really like you to take advantage of it. The one is that we, the, the recording, the audio recording of this conversation today will be broadcast on Bush Radio. And the way that Bush Radio does it is they break it up into segments. So they make an hour segment and another hour segment. And then the third segment, we invite another group of panelists, which could overlap with this group of panelists, to talk about the conversation that we had today. So that in, in that way, we're hoping to make this exponential, the mathematics term of saying how we want it to grow at a rapid rate to get it out there. But there's also another partner in the group, and that's the Argus, the Cape Argus. And everybody in this room, we're asking you to write your story, to write opinion pieces about what it is that you experienced here today, what it is that you heard, what it is that you think. And those pieces that you write will get published in the Argus as op-ed pieces. And Sandy Siwe is sitting over there. She's our first, and she's our communications officer at Cornerstone. She collects all of those inputs from you, and she takes those inputs, and she then ensures, working with the Cape Argus editor, Aziz Hartley, she ensures that it gets published, because as you can see, the Cape Argus is also a partner. Today, we received a wonderful article from Jacob Mayling, who spoke about the experience of watching the District 6 rising from the, the dust um, um, documentary last night. I want to um, sort of end this by, you would have heard Oriel say that after watching uh, my dear children, she was very emotional yesterday morning and left and then had to write. And so she wrote a blog and the last paragraph of a blog says, there might be a great deal about my past that I do not know, many injustices that caused me great distress. But my mother and grandmother said, we are never as alone 
as we fear we are. And hope is indeed all around us. Just open your eyes, your being, your home, your heart. There is a path, a somewhere else, a hopeful place. And perhaps all I need to do is allow the silence to overwhelm me, to remove whatever personal angst I face, and not only reclaim, but reimagine the world I want to step in every day. Thank you, Uri. Very, very powerful words there, which talks to what it is that we want to do when we run the series and what it is that we want to do when we commune with you in making this happen. So I can't thank you enough. Uh, Janine wants to thank the panel personally, and then we've got a few gifts that we'd like to hand over to you before we hand over to the next session. Janine, it's not you. Okay. So thank you again for your time and for your open engagement with the topic and for your honesty as well. Um, Mikalo, Natalia, Luyanda, Luyanda yeah. and Oriel, thank you so much. And we look forward to engaging with you in the future. And we hope that this is just the beginning of an ongoing conversation about reclaiming agency in the arts. Thank you so much. Thank you.